I know a lot of a lot of the people in this room, but not everybody. So I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Christopher Rattay, and it is my privilege as director of the Kelsey Museum to welcome you all here this evening. The Kelsey Museum of Archaeology supports teaching and research on Mediterranean, Egyptian, and Near Eastern archaeology through stewardship of its rich collections, which include about 100,000 artifacts, an active exhibitions program, and sponsorship of ongoing field research. The museum mounts two to three special exhibitions every year. Most of these focus on objects in the collections, but every now and then we host a loan exhibition. This evening, we are gathered together for the opening of the largest and most ambitious such exhibition in Kelsey history. My job this evening is to welcome you all to the exhibition and to introduce the curator, Elaine Costa, who will in turn introduce her colleague and the evening's featured speaker, John Clark. A number of different communities are represented in this evening's audience, the museum staff, Elaine's colleagues in the Department of the History of Art, students and members of the general public, and I would like to extend a special welcome to the last two groups, especially those members of the general public who are also members of the museum, and to whom we are, as always, profoundly grateful for your interest, advice, and support. And I would also, as I always do, like to invite those of you who are not members of the museum to join. <laughs> I want to extend a special invitation to the students in the audience. There's a special membership category for you. You can join for only ten dollars a year. And membership is a great way to see how the museum works from the inside. I would also like to extend a special welcome to the donors to the institution. As a major international traveling show, the budget for this project far exceeded our own resources, and it could not have been possible without private support. To all of you who contributed to the ex exhibition, and your names are listed on the acknowledgement panel at the entrance to the show, are felt thanks. Now to the main event. Elaine Gossa was jointly appointed in the Kelsey Museum in the Department of the History of Art at the University of Michigan in 1974. Her accomplishments over the last 40 years are legion. To mention just a few, she has curated 27, I think that's right, 27 special exhibitions at the PLC. She has published 12 books and exhibition catalogs. She has directed or co-directed 24 doctoral dissertations. She has represented the University of Michigan in numerous national and international fora. She served as a trustee of the American Academy of Rome from 1994 to 2011. She gave the Charles Elliott Morton lectures for the Archaeological Institute of America in 2004-2005. She was elected a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute in 2009. The exhibition and opening this evening is the fruit of several years of collaboration between Elaine Costa and John Clark, professor of history at the University of Texas and co-director of an ongoing international research project on Pontus a seaside town in the Bay of Naples, overwhelmed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the same eruption of Gary Pompeii, in AD 79. It presents a selection of the finds from two remarkable buildings of the Pontus. The first of these, the Pontus A, is a palatial villa, the second a nearby commercial establishment. The show includes a wide range of artifacts from life-size garden, uh, life-size marble, garden sculptures, uh, to the coins and jewelry found on the bodies of victims of the eruption. As befits a teaching museum in a university setting, it also illustrates the accomplishments of recent ongoing research, especially in the reconstruction of wall paintings that decorated the formal rooms of Aplantis A. As highlighted in the title, the exhibition displays the trappings of the life of leisure and luxury associated with U.S. like Aplantis A, but it also examines the profound social inequality of the slave-based society on which that leisure and luxury were built. <coughs> it is now my honor and my pleasure to present to you Professor and Curator Elaine Belsa. I've never seen 
such a crowd for an exhibition opening or even for a big class that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a real uh, honor to have all of you here with us tonight. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce <laughs> Professor John Clark, uh, my co, not curator so much as conspirator, uh, <laughs> conspirator in organizing this exhibition. Uh, he's a wonderful colleague and a dear friend. John is one of the best known historians of Roman art in the world, and a renowned expert on Pompeii, Austria, and of course, Opontus. He has made numerous seminal contributions, beginning with his first book, Roman Black and White Figural Mosaics, published in, uh, the first time in uh, 1979, and we published in 2006, so we know it's a classic, uh, in which he analyzes the way that images move viewers through spaces. And he continues in his second book, now, to develop a, this dynamic approach to viewing and interpreting images in relation to spatial and social settings. This book was called The Houses of Roman Italy, 1991. He moved on to explore Roman art with respect to sexuality, gender, and social class. A series of path-breaking books looking at lovemaking constructions of sexuality in Roman art, 1998. Roman sex, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> 2003, Art in the Lives of Ordinary Romans, Visual Representation and Not Only Viewers in Italy. 2003, two books in one year. Looking at Laughter, Humor, Power, and Transgression in Roman Visual Culture in 2007, and Roman Life also 2007. Prolific is hard of the word for John Clark's publication record. Um, and each book was in the vanguard of scholarship. He has generated subfields of investigation into a wide array of social meanings embedded in Roman visual images seen from the vantage point of diverse viewers. <coughs> when we add to the seven books and well over 100 articles, among them, some on modern art, book chapters and book reviews John has, that John has published, and the many conference papers he has delivered, we have an unparalleled record of scholarly contribution to the field of Roman art history. And now there is the Opontus Project. Launched in 2006, it is perhaps the largest and certainly the most complex undertaking of John's career. The Opontus Project, as you know, involves, I think you know, uh, involves a collaboration between the University of Texas, where John teaches, and the superintendent of, of Pompeii. An ambitious goal to establish with the former uh, super, uh, superintendent, um, Pietro Giovanni Buzzo is to publish the excavations conducted by the Italian archaeologists from the 1960s to the 1990s at Opontis. Um, and at, at both villas, or both structures, Villa A and what we're now calling Opontis B. Along with extensive study of the archives of the early Italian excavations, the Opontis project entails targeted excavation to clarify building chronologies, architectural phases, and an examination of all published, unpublished excavated material that is stored on site and in many rooms um, of Villa A and of Montes B. Some 45 scholars and other specialists are contributing to the publication, which is a four volume open access ebook that is uh, published by ACLS, the American Council of Learned Societies. The first volume is out, the second is due to appear fairly soon, and it's, it's really an incredible undertaking. At Villa A, all of the wall paintings, including many fragments that were not reattached to the walls when the villa was re-erected as an open-air museum, along with the collection of marble sculptures and a host of small finds have already been made available by means of a database linked to the 3D navigable model of the villa, which you may or may not get to see tonight, depending on the internet connection. <coughs> the, um, the digital documentation has been a major goal, in large part, to create a permanent visual record of, of uh, these structures in their current state and to provide digital reconstructions of many parts of the complexes. The project of restudying the, re -ex the excavated material alone has led to new insights into the famous wall paintings in the atrium and the grand reception hall of Villa A, as I hope you will appreciate when you see the exhibition. We actually have fragments from both of these rooms. At Villa for Opontus B, another form of digital recording is ongoing, laser scanning of the entire edifice. Um, the, modern, the model thus produced allowing a recording of the building phases of the structures in this uh, uh, complex. Anyway, I've been working with John and other members of the Bopontis team for the past several years, a little more than four years to be exact, to develop the exhibition 
that you will see this evening, which highlights the main achievements of the earlier excavations and of the specialists currently connected with the Oquantis project. I've often admired the way John manages the multiple day-to-day -day activities carried on at both sites with utter calm, always keeping an eye on the goals of the work to be done, his handling of relations with Italian colleagues on site, with officials of the Southern Peninsula, <laughs> and with authorities in the town of Torre Anunciata, where Oquantis is located, is exemplary. There's no other word for it. He welcomes everyone with a serious interest in working at the site and finds opportunities for them to contribute to the project and grow with it. Through all of this, he manages to keep everyone happy. <laughs> Although I had known John and, and admired his scholarship for decades, my admiration of him has only increased while working closely with him since, since uh, 2012 on the development of the exhibition. He's been a constant support to me, responding to every idea I present and attending immediately to new challenges that constantly arise. Moreover, he is the soul of integrity and one of the most generous scholars I have ever encountered. It is a delight to work with him. John has been honored by prestigious fellowships and awards and has also held important offices and, um, in, in, and so shoulders substantial committee assignments in professional organizations. He's been the president of the College Art Association of America a member of the board of the American Council of Learned Societies and a trustee of the American Academy in Rome. The list goes on, but I think I'll stop here and ask you please to welcome John Clark. Oh. I lost my mic. I knew something fell out here. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, this mic is for the guy with the camera, and this is the one for you, this one here. Um, I don't know what to say. This is the most wonderful introduction I've ever had, and I've been introduced a lot. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, who knows how, how uh, one gets to do all these things? Uh, <clears throat> I can always say that I'm very grateful to have had the chance to uh, work uh, for such a long time in this field, this amazingly prolific field um, and fertile field of, of Roman art history. Um, I have so many people to thank myself, but I'll be content to express particular gratitude to Professor Elaine K. Gosda. Without her creative vision, her enormous expertise and her hard work, this show never would have happened. For me, it's a dream come true, and one that I first shared back in 2009 when, perhaps rashly, <laughs> I asked uh, Pietro Giovanni Guzzo in the Italian Ministry of Culture for permission to pursue an exhibition focused on the ar archaeological sites of Aplontis. Oh, I have to put these on, excuse me. Vanity be damned, huh? Uh, oh, that's so much better. <coughs> the Aplontis project was then in its fifth year, and new discoveries were proliferating. At the prompting of Professor Regina G., one of our core project staff and a former student, I thought, yes, maybe we can do this. But it was only when Elaine joined us that I knew this was a dream that could be realized. In the next 45 minutes, I'd like to introduce you to the four themes in my title, Archives, Excavation, 3D Modeling, and the Exhibition. Let's begin with a view of the area that received the most fallout from the eruption of 79 AD. At the top center, you see the cone of Vesuvius. The eruption was so violent that it reduced the mountain by two-thirds. In the lower right is Pompeii and three miles to the west, Oplantis. As you can see, today both Pompeii and Villa A are much farther inland than they were in antiquity. On the lower left, you see a painted inscription on the shoulder of a terracotta jar made in Lusitania. We just found this out, by the way, from research done a month ago in modern-day Portugal. Originally, it was filled not with lovely wine, but with a nasty fermented fish sauce called garum. There's an address painted on the neck of the amphora. It reads, Secundo Popeii, to Secundus, the slave of Popea. You can see this amphora in the exhibition. Unfortunately, the inscription, the dipinto, is faded. 
Some scholars who read this inscription hastened to proclaim that it was this Popea, the wife of Nero, who owned both Secundus, of course, and Villa A. Unfortunately, Popea is also a clan or a gens name, and there are many individuals bearing this name at Pompeii. So we can't be sure the owner was this famous Popea. That's why we use the lackluster name, let me go back there a minute, uh, of the Villa A rather than the Villa of Popea. We know from the geographer, Roman geographer Strabo, from excavations and from paintings like this one found on the walls of a house of Pompeii, that the entire Bay of Naples was surrounded by luxury villas. The best ones, like the one pictured here, were perched high up, either on man-made platforms or, better yet, on cliffs. From on high, they commanded excellent views of the bay. Understanding just how the villas of Aplontis related to the Bay of Naples was one of our research objectives. Since today, they lie 30 feet below the modern town of Turi Annunziata and half a mile from the water. Villa A was enormous. About half of Villa A has been uncovered, and this excavated area at 200 by 100 meters is enormous. Think two football fields side by side. Most of Villa A is open to the public, <clears throat> but as you go down the stairway, you have little sense of its relation to the Bay of Naples. The same goes for Villa B, just as landlocked. So one of the things we wanted to do was to understand the ancient landscape, and this we do through what's called geoarchaeology. We were lucky enough to find Giovanni Di Maio, a geoarchaeologist dedicated to understanding the turbulent geological history of this region. Each crosslet on this satellite view of the site is an ancient villa with the crosslets and boxes representing Villas A and Villa B, or Oplantis B as we now call it. This is the ancient coast where you can see that villas A and B, appearing here as a crosslet and a circle, are half a mile inland from the modern coastline. It's clear that a massive amount of volcanic material completely changed the ancient coastline in this area. That material pushed the coastline almost half a mile out from the original position um, of villas A and B. The next step was to core. The technique of coring is widespread in archaeology today. A powerful machine capable of boring vertically down as far as 100 feet extracts meter-long samples, one after another, as far beneath the surface as you want to go. When De Mayo cored down in the area where the sea facade of the villa should have been, he discovered the Villa A was perched on a cliff 45 feet above its own private harbor and that Villa B was in a totally different topography, only six to 10 feet above the water. Here's a close-up of that cliff with Villa A sitting on top of it. OS3 is one of the important cores that reached the ancient bedrock beneath the modern water table. The layers represented in pink and light blue are really important. The pink on the bottom represents the first event, the so-called Plinian event of the eruption, uh, the rain of lightweight pumice. The light blue represents the volcanic ash that followed over a two-day period. This later hardened when mixed with rain and sealed the site. So when you come to buy your ticket, I have a ticket buyer there, um, you're standing on top of this parfait of hardened volcanic ash on top of pumice. When you descend the steps to the, see the villa, you're in the area where the ash and pumice have been removed. This view of the edge of the excavated area shows these layers adding up to about 30 feet of volcanic fill. And I want to point out that these layers, these ridges that you see, are pyroclastic flow. And for those of you who know volcanic, volcanoes know that pyroclastic flow is formed when the ash goes back down into the crater, mixes with superheated steam, and creates this um, stream that runs up to 200 miles per hour across the whole of the landscape, uh, cutting down everything in sight. 
So you can see there are repeated pyroclastic flows uh, in this uh, profile. What you don't see is the material that filled the area where the cliff and harbor had been to the south of the site. Most of that material lies under modern streets and apartment buildings. All of De Mayo's cores brought up fragments of parts of the villa that fell over the cliff during the eruption. And the most exciting piece was uh, a perfectly finished and varnished piece of wood from a boat that was under the water table and therefore in an anaerobic atmosphere and preserved. Now that we know that Villa A sat on a 45-foot cliff overlooking its own private harbor, we can begin to understand how impressive it was in antiquity. We can instruct, uh, recon, excuse me, we can reconstruct both the sea facade and the views out from its terraces. Here's the first attempt at reconstructing the villa from the sea. I should mention that, thanks to the results of our geoarchaeology, in October of 2014, the Italian Ministry of Culture initiated its own excavation of the sea facade with spectacular results. Extensive new excavations have uncovered a series of colonnaded terraces built into the cliff and several painted rooms. These terraces and rooms are much like the terraces under the Villa of the Papyri at Herculaneum and the Villa Ariana at Stabiae. Much important material has emerged. Here's my Christmas present. I came back over Christmas, walked into the workroom, and this is a rare vaulted ceiling which um, excavators were able to conserve. It's decorated with green and red stars. <laughs> For reasons of time, and you'll be happy, I have to pass over what we've learned from conventional tre trenches. Five years of excavation at Villa A and four years, and counting, at Aplontes B. Here are uh, two photos of recent trenches at Aplontes B taken from a report that will appear in a few months in the online um, open access journal FASTI, or FASTI online. Um, and another one of our pottery, uh, showing our pottery experts, uh, Jenny Muslin, with a few of the 1,200 amphorae that we are studying. In the plan on the lower right, the pink areas represent our trenches. The goal of the Italian excavations, begun in Villa A in 1964 and at Aplontes B in 1974, was to reconstruct, as far as possible, the original appearance of the two sites, to attract tourists to the economically depressed city of Torria Annunziata. There was no time to excavate beneath the, the 79 uh, AD levels to understand earlier phases. When funds ran out in 1981, the Italian excavations halted. One of the charges of the Aplontes project was to excavate, and this we did and are continuing to do, both with coring and with conventional trenches. The deepest of these, at 12 feet, discovered the prehistoric eruption layers of Vesuvius and plow marks that revealed prehistoric cultivation of the land and much more, but I'm not showing you that. There is, however, another kind of excavation in the archives and storerooms, and that kind of study is essential to putting together the puzzle that is the story of these two villas. Before we put shovel to soil, the Aplontes project team began studying the archives. These consist of excavation diaries, photographs, and plans. There are object archives as well. They include all the materials in the storerooms, from life-size statues to tiny fragments of pottery, glass, and wall painting. Here's a view of the atrium during reconstruction, during the visit of Princess Margaret of England in 1973. She, by the one, is the one with the camera. I was told by Andrew Wallace Hedro, a, a colleague and an art, uh, uh, art historian, uh, that royals are never permitted to shoot photographs. They always get someone else to shoot them for them. And um, I showed him this photograph and I said, Andrew, this is Princess Margaret and look what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Note the newly built wall behind the group and the fragments on the floor. In the lower level is that same wall, in the lower part of the slide on the left, uh, is that same wall when it collapsed several years before that. And on the right, you see the whole thing rebuilt and all kind of plastered over so it looks like it was always there. 
How did restorers, so you, you see all those fragments, so how did the restorers um, deal with them? They stabilized the painted surface with gauze and glue, then put the fragment face down on a table, reinforced it with zinc-coated steel wire, and smeared it with cement. Then they traced out, and I think you can see that, oh, does this, do these lights come off so we can see the slides more clearly? No. Can we, we can't dim the lights at all? I was just thinking you could see the details a lot better. Oh, it's my glasses. <laughs> um, anyway. Then they traced out the patterns of the decoration, as you see in the photo above, and re-cemented the fragment onto the rebuilt wall. However, what I kept finding as I dug through mountains of fragments were pieces that never made it back into the walls. And it's the results of this research that you'll find in the exhibition. Fabulous frescoes hidden from view for over 50 years. Here are some of the fragments that we saw on the floor in the photo. Is that better? Ah, benissimo, okay. Um, here are some of those fragments that we saw on the floor in the photo with Princess Margaret. They ended up in a dark storage room. I asked one of our architects, Timothy Lydell, to try to put them together. Voila, using Photoshop and Illustrator, he was able to manipulate the images of the fragments at will. Tim found an important clue part of an ionic capital, which is right down here, and you're going to see it in a minute, so exciting, um, that suggested these fragments belong to a lost upper story of the atrium's decoration. Sure enough, he was able to put most of these fragments together, and this is what you will see in the exhibition. Here are the fragments um, digitally superimposed on what you see if you visit Oplantis and look at the west wall of the atrium. Martin Blaisby, one of our digital artists who has worked for many years on reconstructions of Pompeian wall painting schemes, came up with this image. It shows what kind of overall decorative scheme might have surrounded Tim's deliberately conservative reconstruction of the fragments we have. When, after seven years' work on these orphaned fragments, I thought we had located, studied, and photographed all of them, around 5,000, I found a suspicious looking pile under a skyscraper of yellow crates like the ones you see in the background of this photograph. Luckily, Professor Gazda was there and with her keen eye she began reassembling the group. By this point we had realized that these fragments belonged to room 15, the most famous of the wall paintings at, at the villa. It's the, it's the one with the big peacocks uh, facing each other across the golden tripod of Apollo. So, pinned, as you can see, to the shelf is a big color print of the surviving east wall of room 15. Our big surprise was that these fragments represented that wall in mirror reversal. This meant that they came from the west, or left-hand wall of the room, which remains unexcavated because it lies 30 feet under one of the main streets of Torre Annunziata. <laughs> we called on Tim once again, and he was able to reconstruct the area of this lost wall that the fragments came from. And you'll see this in the exhibition. It looks fabulous. Just like these orphaned fragments of frescoes, the archives communicate the excitement of discovery. These photos taken in 1975 show the pioneer of Roman of, uh, garden archaeology, um, Wilhelmina Jashemsky, assisting as the head of a Julio-Claudian woman is discovered in the north garden of Villa A with the pedestal that supported it. You can see this fine portrait in the exhibition as well. Eight more sculptures were found in the final phases of the Italian excavation. Many of them were found where they fell, on bases and pedestals around the huge 61 meter long swimming pool. After they were partially conserved, the photos you see on the right were taken. This was the one day that the sculptures were displayed in anything like the way they were in antiquity. The following day, everything was hauled into the site warehouse where they have remained for 45 years. Particularly lovely is the photo on the upper left. We see an excavator, uh, he's still around, I know this guy, falling in love with a beautiful Nike. 
We get even more excitement of that day in these photos. Note the photo on the lower left. It's the statue of Artemis, another beauty in our ex exhibition, trussed up with ropes and tied to rude poles so she could be hauled up to the warehouse and never seen again. Today, a visitor sees a bare landscape around the pool. Ideally, copies of the sculptures should be placed there, but our own approach is to restore them to, to their original setting using 3D modeling. In order to capture an image in 3D, it's necessary to scan it. There are two main methods to achieve a 3D image, laser scanning and photogrammetry. The laser scanner shoots thousands of laser beams at every surface of the object. In post-processing, the surfaces of the object are reconstituted into a mesh made by triangulating the points. To create a 3D image through photogrammetry, on the other hand, the operator takes many digital photos from all possible angles and software stitches them into a three-dimensional replica of the original. Although dubbed Villa B, the site 400 meters to the south of Villa A, was not a luxury villa, nor even a rustic farming villa. It was a commercial center, surrounded by, a modest, by modest two story apartment buildings. For this reason, we called it a Plantis B. Its impressive two story peristyle, built almost 100 years before Villa A, saw intense commercial activity. Was it the property of Lucius Crassius Tertius, whose seal ring was found in the debris? Or was Lucius the manager of the wine bottling that took place there? You can see his seal ring in the exhibition with the abbreviation LCRSTER. The four sides of the peristyle were filled with wine jars known as Dressel 2-4 Amphorae, stacked upside down, the pointed end of one vessel inserted into the mouth of the one above it. Presumably, this is a way of storing empty amphorae to dry after being watch, washed and pitched. Yes, they pitched the amphorae, which I think is the birth of Retsina. A very bad idea, uh, in my opinion. Um, another astounding discovery of the late 1970s and the early 80s was the two groups of skeletons found in a barrel vaulted room south of the big peristyle. The first group toward the entry of the room was loaded with coins and jewelry. This is the photo of skeleton 27 with a particularly rich hoard of jewelry and coins. For this first group, excavators removed the bones, many of them crushed by the collapse of the ceiling and put them in boxes for study. Here, however, you see the second group at the back of the room excavated several years later. This group had no money, no jewelry, but rather lantern, lanterns and tools. These skeletons were left in place, as you can see in this photo. Some scholars have proposed that this group at the back of the room consisted of slaves, segregated from their masters, even in death. You will find fine examples of coins and jewelry in the exhibition. Some of, them, some of the coins, especially the gold ones from the period of Vespasian, are mint fresh, since they didn't have time to cir circulate before the eruption. Others, so spend your money now. <laughs> Others, especially a group of silver denarii, include really old coins, like this one of Quintus Metellus of 130 BC. They show, these, these early ones show lots of wear from over a century of circulation. Some scholars have proposed that these denarii belonged to a coin hoard. Like the study of the coins, examination of the jewelry carried out by Courtney Ward reveals that some of the pieces were heirlooms. Alongside pieces of great value, some inexpensive costume jewelry, um, I'm sorry, along with pieces of great value, uh, excavators found some inexpensive pieces of costume jewelry, perhaps only of sentimental value. Working through the archives, we realized that the existing plans of Oplantis B were inaccurate, really bad, depending as they did on old surveying techniques. To achieve an accurate plan of Oplantis B, we engaged Marcus Abbott, whom you see here, to record every wall, floor, and ceiling with laser scanning. The process is similar to that used for objects like the sculptures I mentioned earlier. 
The scanner emits millions of laser beams to create what is called a point cloud array. So software then knits these points together into polygons that are so numerous that they provide a 3D image. On the left is the setup of the scanner, and on the right, a section of the 3D scan showing several amphorae leaning <coughs> against a bank of hardened volcanic material. Although this, although this may not look like much, remember that the image on the right, unlike a conventional photograph, is fully three-dimensional. You can navigate it. Compare the setup of the laser scan scanner with the resulting image. The point cloud array has recorded the current position of the skeleton so that if they deteriorate further, and they are deteriorating, scholars will have an accurate record. What is more, because they are recorded with great precision, measurements in the laser scan uh, equal those of the skeletons themselves with a margin of error of only three to five millimeters. And obviously, it would be nearly impossible to get an overhead shot of the skeletons using conventional photography. You could do it with a drone, perhaps. As for the building as a whole, a scan like this, because of its near-perfect accuracy, far outstrips plans made with a total station, the kind of electron electronic transit or theodolite normally used in archaeological recording. It would take a full day of work with the total station to shoot 20 or so points, while the laser scanner will have already created several million. So, although this image may not look like much, Scans like this enabled one of our architects, Jess Galloway, to create the first accurate plan of a Pluntus B, and that plan is in three dimensions. Um, and because it is three-dimensional, uh, Abbott's scan can also be imported directly into the 3D model that we're creating. How to publish all of this research? I decided to publish in three ways, as an open access ebook as a navigable 3D model, and as a database linked to the model. Bo Volume 1 of the Born Digital eBook appeared in December 2014. I would like to give it to all of you right now. <laughs> this is kind of a, a local joke, but uh, our local grocery store, uh, the monstrous uh, omnipresent HEB, <laughs> That makes everyone laugh in Texas. Uh, <laughs> uh, now I have a mandate from my computer to do something different. Okay. Let me get rid of that. Get rid of that. Okay, we're in the 3D model. And we're in the room that I was just talking about. This is, of course, the, uh, the room uh, with the peacocks, which I mentioned to you earlier. And in the 3D model, you can go anywhere you want, look at anything you want to look at. I have to do this. There we go. Um, and it is completely 3D. So the fragments that I was just talking about came from this wall, which as you can see, whoops, it's very, it's not excavated. So we are reconstituting through the model um, a part of the villa not known. Now, um, in the interest of brevity, I'll show you a few things that this will do. Uh, we can change the light levels in a 24-hour scheme. So we find the best time to look at the villa is right around there, uh, this room. Um, we can turn on and off reconstructions. <coughs> and so we have reconstructed many rooms. Um, and you see that little white dot in the middle? That means that this is live. And if I hit the Q button, we go to our database everywhere but in this room. So what happens in this room is we don't go there. We should be there already. <laughs> That's what I was trying to straighten out for the last hour before this lecture. But you know, the curse of electronics is always upon you. Sooner or later, it will get you back. Anyway, it might be a firewall on my computer. I, I didn't even think of changing computers. But anyway, so you're spared the database. Lucky you, huh? <laughs> Now, what is so amazing, and the, the news that has me all for today, is that this is now an Oculus Rift. 
That means you can just put on glasses, basically, and navigate without using a computer. It's astonishing. Um, I will say that if you get motion sickness, take some Dramamine with you. But you, you are literally in these spaces. There's just no doubt about it. And, uh, and the model, actually, this one I'm showing you is an older version. It's been much improved by the wonderful people at the, uh, what's it called? The, the 3D lab, yeah. So there's what it looks like if you go there. And this is, and uh, let's see, I'm going to transport us somewhere else. Let's go over to the pool. I always like to dive in the pool. That's room 60. You see, we have 100 rooms. And as I say, it's not even fully excavated. There's the pool as it looks today with this ugly roof on it. In the, in the, uh, the new model, in the restored version, you have beautiful um, black marble columns. Uh, holding this up. Uh, I must say they did a wonderful job. So, we're in this portico and we can navigate freely anywhere we want to go. We can inspect spaces, we can change lighting levels, and uh, everywhere but here we can immediately uh, go to the online database. This online database is open and free to the public. Just go to our website and you'll be in the matrix. Okay. I, anyway, I think I'll, I don't want to make this too long. You can get to play with this yourself. And um, I've been criticized for being overly um, <laughs> anxious to play with the model in front of people. <laughs> Just a bad boy, that's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> um, here's a substitute for that. Um, this is to show you that we actually do research with this. Um, within the model, you can, of course, click on elements, such as a wall or the floor of the room, and that will take you to the project database. And I like this interface. I like the, the fact that you can go directly from the model to whatever it is you're looking for, because it locates what you want to see spatially. It's not like a book where you have to leaf through and go to the plates, then you have to go to the list of contents, and so on and so forth. The database is quite rich. It includes archival photographs showing the processes of excavation and restoration. It records objects uh, with captions, excavation diaries, and much more. It puts all the information that we've gathered over the years and the information that our uh, many collaborating scholars worldwide have entered into the database into the hands of everyone. Our aims with 3D model were threefold. To record, let's do that again, it was fun. Um, to record the actual state of the villa, to relate all of the features of the villa to the project database, and to create a tool for testing rec recent hypotheses. In this excerpt from the model which I'm showing you, we're testing the views through and alongside the famous garden rooms. The architect of Villa A inserted these garden rooms between the three main dining rooms of the East Wing. They were purely decora decorative since they were not meant to be entered. They were open to the air and rain and painted with representations, as you see, of gardens on their walls. Our initial charge, way back in 2006, when we first got permission to study, excavate, and publish the Villas of Aplantis, was to apply the widest range of techniques from traditional excavation to digital research to this important UNESCO World Heritage Site. I am surprised at how much we have been able to do, thanks to generous funding from the University of Texas, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and many private donors. Thanks also to our 46 collaborators, scholars, um, and an average of 40 eager volunteers who arrive each year to help. It's been an adventure, as I hope my talk is uh, showing you. But the jewel in the crown, as far as I'm concerned, is this marvelous exhibition first conceived in 2009 and realized with the work of individuals too numerous to name here, it is, of course, to Elaine Gazda that I owe special thanks, for she brought it all together, and it wasn't easy. <laughs> it's a very different kind of exhibition from those blockbusters on Pompeii, entertaining as they are with CGI volcanoes rumbling and wild speculation run amok. <laughs> this show is monographic 
in the sense that it takes you deeply into the very different lives lived in these two adjacent complexes. If we must picture a lavish, lavish entertainments in Villa A, I've always imagined they performed water ballet in this 200 foot long swimming pool, don't you think? At Aplantis B, we have seen the hustle and the bustle of a thriving wine bottling emporium. Side by side as they were, Aplantis B represents the commerce and the hard backbreaking work of ordinary people, some of them slaves, that made the life of leisure and luxury of Villa A possible. Unlike any other exhibition in Pompeii, this one provides an in-depth view, and because of your easy access to the scholarship behind the exhibition, whether through the ebook or the database or the model, you can carry on your own research. This is what I hope the Aplantis Project, and especially this traveling exhibition, will be able to accomplish. I speak for the many dedicated individuals who are part of the Aplantis Project when I tell you that our greatest pleasure is to share our discoveries, big and small, with you. We hope this exhibition, exhibition will pique your interest and perhaps bring you to the site someday. But even if Tori Annunciata is not on your bucket list, we hope that you will continue to explore Aplantis through this exhibition and our open access publications. Thank you very much.